This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, welcome to Bali for our service today. Let's worship God together as we begin with a hymn which John will play for us now. This morning will be given for us by Carol Nixon. The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 3 verses 4 to 17 and read from my great-grandmother's family Bible. 
And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptised of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for the repentance. And think not to say with yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is led unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptise you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptised of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptised of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfil all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptised, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here ends the reading. Well, as Carol has told us, our reading today comes from the King James or Authorised Version of the Bible, from Matthew's Gospel. And it comes to, from Carol's own family Bible, from a Bible which once belonged to her great-grandmother, and Carol has also sent in an illustration from her family Bible, an illustration that accompanies this story, an engraving from the Bible of the baptism of Jesus. We can see the picture now with Jesus on the right, bathed in light, as the heavens are opened and the Spirit of God descends like a dove. John the Baptist is on the left, of course, quite a forbidding figure one crying in the wilderness. Our illustration shows someone who had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. We're also told that he lived on a diet of locusts and wild honey, which is all indicative of the fact that he was a prophet who did not compromise. He gave no quarter to anyone who fell short and was not slow to condemn them. He was baptising people in the Jordan and attracting great crowds when he saw, Matthew says, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism. He was not slow to voice his contempt for them. He said to them in the words of the authorised version, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? All versions of the Bible say something similar. But it is John who baptises Jesus in the River Jordan. And baptism has continued as an important rite for us ever since. Although one that's largely been held over for most of the last year. Although there have been some baptisms, a lot of the time we've just not been able to carry out this sacrament as people would have wished. And we'll have to wait for return of a more normal time before we can do so in many cases. But we understand baptism as a sacrament within the community. It is something that carries with it a sense of holiness, something that moves into the heart and mind of each of us when we consider it, and of course when we bring a baby into the church to be baptised. But it is the baptism of Jesus that I would like to talk about today 
we get a very vivid account in the Gospels. And part of this is the interaction between Jesus and John the Baptist. This foreboding figure, gathering the following out in the wilderness and baptising people in the Jordan, warned of more wrath to come. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. He spoke also of someone mightier than he who would come after him, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. But he warned, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire, as it says in the Revised Standard Version. But in Matthew's Gospel, but not in Mark's or Luke's Gospel, we get this exchange whereby John is reluctant to baptise Jesus, with John telling him that it should be the other way round. I need to be baptised by you, and do you come to me? Mark and Luke hint at this idea with John saying that he's not worthy to untie or carry the sandals of the one who is coming. But Matthew's is also the only gospel that includes Jesus' reply to John's objection. In the language of the authorised version, it says, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfil all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So Jesus prevails and John baptises him. Now this story is often part of the season of Epiphany slightly earlier in the year, which includes this time of showing or revelation. But there is a subtle difference in the way Matthew tells the story compared to the other Gospels. The encounter between Jesus and John is suggestive of a different kind of revelation being conveyed. John's objection was that Jesus ought to be baptising him rather than the other way round, because Jesus was the one, the Messiah, after all. John was simply a messenger, a forerunner. But as Jesus insists that John should baptise him, he says also he should let go of his vision of how things should be. In the RSV, it is put like this. Jesus says, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. This is because in God's kingdom, the least are blessed above all. The least amongst us thereby become the primary means of blessing to others. This is the way the kingdom of God comes into being. We can think back again to the Beatitudes. In this act of baptism, we have an epiphany. A revelation. When Jesus is baptised, as he comes up out of the water, he sees the heavens opening, a traditional sign of revelation. Straight away he sees the Spirit of God descending and alighting upon him, and a voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But what is interesting here with this account in Matthew's Gospel is that this is a revelation for Jesus. One of the significant things here is that it is Jesus that sees the Spirit of God descending upon him. It is a revelation, another epiphany. But essentially it is something that Jesus sees. It is a revelation or a sign to him. A moment of self-awareness about his mission. It is a subtle difference, but if you look in Luke's Gospel, the suggestion is made that it is the whole crowd that watches the dove coming out of heaven. But that's not the case in Matthew's Gospel. This is something that comes to Jesus. And it comes as a contrast to the heightened emotions that seem to surround John's ministry. On the edge of the Jordan. This is the moment that begins Jesus' ministry. 
and it commences because he receives a moment of self-realization which is to sustain him through all he does. It is a moment when he acquires a full sense of his own identity. It is a moment of blessing. It's quite unlike the notions of winnowing forks and threshing floors which we read about shortly before. This is a blessing made with water, light and love. It's a meaning that has continued with us forever after. We see it very much in baptism when we celebrate the sacrament. But we see it too throughout all the life and work of our church. Amen. Well, let's join together now in the fellowship of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us with your good and kindly spirit. Inspire our worship and tell us of your love, so that we may share your mercy and receive your peace. We bring you now our lives as they are, our joys and sorrows, our hopes and fears. There are things that are good in us and things that are wrong in us, and we look to you for healing and encouragement. As we have been forgiven, so may we forgive. As we've been welcomed by our Heavenly Father, so may we practice hospitality of heart and home. In the days which lie ahead of us, give us those things which we need to make us useful and cheerful disciples. These and all our prayers we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And we'll listen now to our second hymn, which John will play for us. Thank you to Carol for reading for us today. 
And thank you also to John for playing for us. And let's close now with the benediction. Let us pray. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and evermore. Amen.